All right. Welcome this afternoon to our Evrolo webinar on understanding memorizing your VCE content. Um, my name is Lyndon. I am a past teacher. I used to teach chemistry. I used to roll with my students um, and now get to yeah, spend time with students such as yourselves, helping them get more value from this platform. Um, but we've also, besides me, got um, Zoe on the call with us this afternoon. She's um, our... Uh, helping us write our year seven and eight maths content, but she's also a, a recent VCE student who now does VCE uh, performance coaching with year 12 students. And so she's got a wealth of knowledge that she's going to be sharing with you guys this afternoon. I can't wait for you to meet her and be able to um, hear from her. So it's going to be a lot that she'll run through. So grab a pen, grab some paper and note down those things that stand out to you that make most sense that you'll be able to take and apply as you so have these couple months before your VCE exams. Um, I've also got my colleague Tasha, she's sitting on the chat. Um, so if there's questions that come up, what I'd encourage you to do, if you can open up the Q&A function through Zoom, if you put your questions through there, that'll make sure that we get to them and don't miss anything. So um, we'll also have about 10 minutes at the end for any um, Q&A also. So if you put them in there, we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, all right. Well, I might hand over to Zoe. Zoe, are you on the line there with us? Yes, I am. Let me just get my technology sorted. Okay, I think we're good. Are we good? I think I can just see the top half of you. If you want to move that camera oh. down a little, we might okay. see your oh. lovely face. Fantastic. That's my Great. start. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll um, let you so take it away. A makeshift technology situation today. So, yeah. I'll do my best. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction, Lyndon. Before I talk a little bit about myself, I thought I'd get right into what I hope you'll get out of today. First, we're going to learn how to memorize information quickly over long periods of time using counterintuitive but effective techniques. We'll learn how to deeply understand content faster using structural priming. We'll also look at effective ways me and my clients kick procrastination, stay motivated, and wisely use our time. It's a mix of stuff that worked for us and tips that leverage scientific research. Now, I only have half an hour, so I'm basically introducing ideas. If you want to take action, you will need to research these concepts a little bit yourself after the session. I'll give some suggested resources to do that after the session though. Remember that we're also concluding with a Q and A. I'm also here to show you how we can enact techniques using a drollo. Typically, I don't like plugs myself, but really a drollo is that good. But firstly, a little bit of background about me. I graduated in 2020 with an ATAR of 99.45. I mainly did maths and science subjects, but my best result was a 15 English language. Now I'm studying teaching at Monash, doing VC performance coaching and tutoring, and I'm working on maths textbooks at Edrollo. The reason I share this with you is not to say that I have all the answers, but because I have been where you are, and I was able to use a bunch of successful strategies to get through year 12 and do pretty well. I wanna share these with you today. I got my ATAR in what was a pretty tough year for me personally. Yes, there were COVID lockdowns, but I also had my grandmother who I lived with become really sick and need more intensive care. So believe me, I am well aware that there's more to life than year 12 and that things can and do go horribly wrong. Ultimately, what got me through was managing myself to get stuff done and work smart using research back study techniques. This is the major reason I do year 12 performance coaching now. Outside of my work and study, I find balance through my family and friends and boring dancing. I really encourage you to find your thing and make sure there's more to your life than work. But on to business. I'm hoping that you're here because you're realizing that you want to get better results than you currently are, so that you're open to different ways of doing things. But I thought this would still be a good reminder. What I'm sharing today is, I dare say, different to what you were already doing. But basically, if you want to improve your marks, you will need to change your strategy. Let's start with how we memorize the stuff we study. Now, memorization is not sufficient. After all, you should never memorize anything you don't understand. However, memorization is still super important. Why? Most obviously, rote memorization of information like definitions reduces that margin of error if you're asked to supply that definition in the exam. But also, it frees up your working memory for other things in the middle of your exam. Take, for instance, your English exam essay where you have to use quotes from the book. Struggling to remember a quote or a 
an example that you half remember is not ideal. It wastes valuable time. And when you're occupied with recall, you're not thinking critically about the prompt, you're not remembering your mental plan, and you're certainly not checking your written expression. I see this so often when people come to me at the end of the year for in-line tutoring. So I guess think of memorization as automation. The more stuff we make automatic, the more free marks we score, and the more we can redirect our brain to other things. Like most people, I began my learning to study journey with making summaries in my own words. I would then rewrite a more condensed version of that summary, and then another more condensed version of that summary to ensure it was active learning. I thought this automatically made it supremely effective. In reality, it was a fun activity for a stationary fiend. I rewarded myself with calligraphy pens, highlighters, and gel pens. Then I actually congratulated myself for being productive. I guess in the early days, I was operating under the delusion that not only was I understanding and retaining the information, but the more pages in my summary, the more tangible proof of how productive I'd been. But we should not measure productivity by the page. When I looked at my outcomes and started digging deeper into the research, I came to realize that the summaries were my, the sugar of my studying diet. I guess not entirely without sustenance, but not the healthiest food to have. Here is something that is unfortunately true. Science shows us we are terrible at objectively judging what study methods are best for us. The hardest way to learn feels easy and intuitive, and the easiest way to learn feels hard. This sounds very counterintuitive, especially given the common but false advice that we should find what works best to fit our own personal learning style. The reality is this. Good study techniques force our brains to build connections. This encodes information more strongly, resulting in more reliable and faster recall. The process of forcing these connections feels hard. Bodybuilders know it's at the point when lifting weight starts to feel difficult that the real muscle development begins. So let your mental resistance to a certain approach be a guide. If you don't want to do it, you are probably on the right track. When we do easier study like highlighting and note taking, we genuinely feel like stuff is going in. But really, this is just familiarity. That's why open book note taking has limited effectiveness for memory. When researchers compare study methods, it falls around the middle of the pack. And this is for people who have been formally trained in the art of summarizing after years at uni. The average high school student? No way. It's certainly more effective than rereading or highlighting, but there are significantly more efficient and effective things we can be doing with our time. Our, wains, our brains are wired to trick us into feeling we need copious amounts of sugar, but the food which is best for us is often better. The Kayla study is testing yourself from memory, and we combine this with spaced out practice and deep understanding, neither of which is exactly a picnic. The proper name for self-testing is active recall. You may have heard of active versus passive learning. This is pretty much as active as it gets. Flashcards, tests at school, any time you have to remember any information without looking at notes. All of these are variants of active recall. It is the single most effective study principle ever discovered as demonstrated by a mountain of research. Why does it work? The way the brain makes long-term connections is based around how much you retrieve information from your brain. We all have this misconception that in order to study, we have to put stuff into our brains, but actually it's flipped on its head if you look at literature. It turns out the actual way to remember and learn anything is to retrieve information from our brains rather than these relatively doomed attempts to put it back in. Then we supercharge this by repeating this over time, but at very specific intervals. This is called spaced repetition. A lot of people who cram a few weeks from the exam will revise the same information many times more than they're shown here. But these people actually recall the information more poorly than people who review the same information less, but space it out more. This again is the opposite of what most people would expect. Why does it work? This is explained by the forgetting curve, which has been really well established in the psychology literature for over a century. The forgetting curve is the idea that over time, we forget things at an exponential rate, unless there is some sort of intervention from us. The way we can take advantage of the forgetting curve is breaking the cycle by reviewing material at spaced intervals. In essence, the idea behind spaced repetition is that you allow your brain to forget some of the information to ensure that the active recall process remains hard. Remember, the harder your brain has to work to retrieve information, the more likely it is the information will be encoded. The more we practice and the more space repetition becomes, the more likely we are to remember. 
The easiest and cheapest way to implement this is to put the content you need to remember into Anki, a free tool on your laptop. You can pay a lot of money to have it on a tablet or a phone, but the desktop version is literally the same. All you have to do is open the app every day and it will space rep everything for you, taking into account how easily you remember stuff. Basically, it makes active recall and space repetition idiot proof. I highly recommend this. Honestly, if you've got a drollo, study design, exam reports, and Enki, you're pretty much set. I can't give you a demo now, but there are lots of excellent ones on YouTube. Pro tip, the best ones are by medical students. Memorization is all well and good, but it is nowhere near as important as deeply understanding the material. Never, ever memorize something without understanding it first. Now, the most efficient way to acquire a deep understanding of any content is not summary making, but a combination of pre-study core structural priming, then learning the content in layers. Hopefully you've been through most of the material already, and you're now filling in gaps and just getting through the rest of unit four. You still can reap the benefits of pre-study as the first step in your revision though. Structural priming. Essentially, you're building a hierarchy of information while creating relationships across broad ideas. This is looking at the syllabus and then breaking down the information to provide a structure. You can then work from that systematically. Textbooks do this a little bit, but I recommend using a visual aid like tree diagrams and mind maps or a digital tool. Personally, I use Notion. Then I would check this against the Adrolo video list or the contents page in the Adrolo books because they break things down a lot more. Categorization, I guess, breaks down the material instead of learning it as one large chunk. You could visualize this body of knowledge as a tree with every branch extending into ever smaller branches. What you're essentially doing is priming your brain to build relationships faster because you've got that broad overview of the subject and the ideas you're going to be covering. And ultimately, a lot of what you're assessed on comes from a deep understanding of these relationships. Importantly, it's going to be super helpful in identifying the high yield information, which is a concept I'll cover a bit later. Also, you're going to have improved recall of that information as a result of this structure. Essentially, it's the difference between trying to find a particular shirt in a massive pile of your clothes on the floor and finding it in a well-organized closet. You'll find the shirt faster, right? Likewise, you'll find whatever piece of information you're after. A point I wanna drive home here is pre-study or structural priming should not be a massive use of your time. If it is, you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't be learning the nitty gritty details of the subject yet. Structural priming ideally takes place before you learn the material, but maybe for you guys, it's going to be before you embark on any further revision. This technique has saved myself, my students, and my friends doing courses like med 10 to 20 hours. Seriously, it's great. Okay, so I've just got a short video. Um, let's see if I can get this. To... Okay, cool. It's basically a super simple but effective example of how we can implement this. Um, this is Ali Abdul, my favorite YouTube channel ever. And this is how he used it in Cambridge Medicine. One way to think about this is to build what I like to call a tree of knowledge around our subject, around a topic. And that is starting with a, like a main trunk and then building a branches off it such that anytime we get any new piece of information, we're able to hang it on one of the branches of our tree. And I'll give you an example from medical school. So I used to find the topic of hematology, which is the study of the blood, quite overwhelming because there's so much various things that can go wrong with the blood. But then one day I sat down and decided, you know what, I'm just gonna build a tree of knowledge. I didn't call it a tree of knowledge back then, but that's kind of what I was thinking. I'm just gonna sit down and build my tree of knowledge about hematology. And I realized that looking through the specification, looking through the syllabus, looking through a few textbooks and online resources, that everything within hematology can pretty much be categorized into three things. Problems with anemia, i.e. your hemoglobin levels going too low. Secondly, problems with clotting. And thirdly, the cancer malignant hematology stuff. And then within those, we've got our own subcategories. So within anemia, we've got microcytic anemia, normocytic anemia, macrocytic anemia. And within those, we've got some more categories. Within coagulation, we've got things that make you clot versus things that make you bleed. Within malignant hematology, we've got four things. We've got the lymphomas, we've got leukemias, we've got the myeloproliferative disorders, we've got the plasma cell dyscrasias and a few other things. I'm, I'm creating my tree of knowledge. And I, I found that since creating this tree of knowledge for hematology, I've started to understand the subject a lot better because now when I come across, I don't know, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, I know exactly where it fits on my little branch thing. And when I come across Burkitt's lymphoma or something, I know exactly where that fits in my thing. When I come across antiphospholipid syndrome, I'm not thinking, oh crap, what is that? I'm thinking, oh, I know that that fits on that branch of the coagulation tree and therefore this is what's going on there. And so overall, this makes the whole subject a lot less overwhelming. And I kind of wish I'd been doing this from day one of medical school for every single subject. And I wish I'd started doing that before even 
learning the subject. Like when I was scoping the subject, which is what I like to call it, i.e. just sitting down with the syllabus and working out what is everything within cardiology, what is everything within respiratory medicine, just taking those one or two hours to sit down and build a tree for that subject would have done absolute wonders for me because then when I get new pieces of information, I'm not just, you know, chucking it into a notebook and hoping that it sticks. I'm hanging it on my tree of knowledge and therefore... Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, okay, let's me get this working again. Slideshow. Okay, cool. So yeah, this works well in bio for sure, but I also did something relatively similar for English language to build a super robust understanding. Then the only things I ended up memorizing were template essay paragraphs. As great a technique memorizing is, we ultimately want to minimize the amount of information we memorize. A deep holistic understanding is a fantastic way to do that. I've also attached an Archer Newton video here, which is a bit more detailed since I am out of time to fully cover this. Wait, no, don't play again, please. Okay, yes, I'm in the next slide. Learning occurs in layers. You start with your hierarchy, then revisit the information again and again with a certain goal. Like, now I've got the gist of it, I want more detail, or I don't understand this particular mechanism. Now, this is going to be different for different people. I personally taught myself all of the content for all of my subjects by the end of semester one, and then I treated my lessons thereafter as revision lectures. Some people may be pressed for time and can't do this many layers. This is just a sample structure. The point is you have a logical process you follow for understanding everything in the course. And between stages, you know what your questions are and attempt to answer them by the next layer in the process. That's what that orange arrow represents. And the reason that I love Edrollo so much as a student and now as someone working for them is because it is an amazingly useful resource at each of these stages. It breaks down the syllabus and topics into subtopics and videos, depending on whether you're working with the textbook or just the videos. You can watch the videos or ahead of class. You can dip into a drawer as required to answer questions. And you have a ton of high quality exam style questions. There's a lot in the video package. If you look at the textbook, there's even more. And what's being covered by my Zoom thing is also a self reading tool, which I will cover in a bit. Okay, so if you do end up doing that, a useful strategy can be to make a note of which bits of information are still confusing so that when you chat to a teacher, you know exactly what your question is. The students who understand ideas the fastest are the ones who don't let their questions select. Now, is a drawer a magic bullet? Of course not but you already have access to a draw load, so it would be a massive waste to not use such a quality resource. It also is study design aligned and provides comprehensive alternative explanations to your own teacher, so you don't need to invest in tutors. This combined with exam style questions, video solutions, and some pretty intuitive features, plus your teachers, will give you all the tools you really need to succeed. Having a core resource saves you time in reading subpar material to try and get the concept. This enables you to move on to the main business of exam prep. If you've got the textbooks, you're particularly lucky. I use them myself as my only resource for physics and chem, and using them with intelligent study practices made it much easier for me to do pretty well with what was actually a pretty low time investment. These are all the subjects we have a drawer courses for in the VCE. Textbook options have also been highlighted, which have hundreds of incredible practice questions. If you do one of these and don't have a course or textbook for it, you can ask your teacher to get in touch with us and we'll set up a free trial for your class. After all, I'm not saying that you don't need an information source. Of course, for most subjects, you need to sit down, figure out what to memorize and have that recorded somewhere, ideally on Enki flashcards. What I am saying is that the compilation process should be done as quickly as possible. It is there to tell you what to memorize. Here's how I go about it using a drawer. I tell my students to prioritize the stuff they memorize based on two key characteristics. Number one, what is explicitly identified on study design, not tangents that help you understand it, like case studies, stuff like that. That's worth hearing when you're learning the concept, but you don't need it memorized for an exam, especially when you're pressed for time. Number two, what comes up a lot, which you find out by checking out the exam reports in detail at the earliest opportunity. Put it this way, consider how notoriously content heavy bio is. I use this method to rapidly get everything down to about 10 well-spaced pages, and then some supplementary maybe material that got it to just over 20. For physics, my A3 cheat sheet didn't just have some of what I needed, it had all of my high yield information. I tell you, this technique is very powerful and saves you a lot of time. 
One of the things I tell my students to do before they start compiling info is going to the exam reports and past exams and gather improved definitions and explanations from the guidelines to memorize word for word on Enki. Now, you may need to modify these in the middle of an exam slightly to tailor to the question, but ultimately it frees your working memory to actually be thinking rather than perfecting wording. It also means that you have immediately got the high frequency concept solid in your memory. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily neglect the whole syllabus. Edrola gives you study notes aligned to the study design ready for your exams. Once you've understood stuff and you're ready to get to the memorizing part, get the bits that line up with the dot points, make an anchor flashcard and get cracking. Now for a bit of a change, let's talk about motivation, time management and procrastination. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of issue changing slides. There we go. So here are two of the major problems I see. Overscheduling, which is taking on too much in the time frame, and procrastination. The resolution to both is quite similar. Ah, there we go. For most students, I advise them to schedule study last. After school hobbies, etc., go in first. This means you'll have a realistic idea of how much study you're going to do. If you end up skipping some of the things you schedule, great, more time for study. Just don't plan on it. I also recommend that you do some experimentation and figure out what periods in the day are best for you. For me, it's the early hours in the morning. Then leverage this time for study and the afternoon slump or whatever your equivalent is for relaxation. When you're scheduling, don't make task-based to-do lists. Believe me when I say that everything takes longer than you think and all you, commit to, all you can commit to is spending time on something, not completing it. I had to move away from daily to-do lists because for me, they were a recipe for unfulfilled expectations and disappointment. Instead, I moved towards time blocking and systems. And there's a lot of great content on that on the internet. It's better to say, I will spend an hour revising for my physics test than to assume I could complete the set of questions in that time. I also like to routines like when I first get up, I will try a maths exam every day. But what's really better than any of that time management stuff for me personally is considering priorities, which helps both overscheduling and procrastination. The most important way I did this is what I call the one thing principle. It's actually very simple. While you're having your morning coffee, you ask yourself, what is the one thing I can do today that's going to have the most impact on my ATAR? Then make it happen as soon as you can. There's other advice out there that says you should start with something to gain momentum, like note taking or easy homework. This has some merit and may well work for you. But oftentimes I found that when I applied that strategy, I worked all day and I gained very little. The one thing principle helped keep frustration in check, identified areas requiring more work and built confidence that I would actually be ready for my final exams. It's similar to the pay yourself first principle in investing, where you basically put your money into long-term savings before you do anything else with your money. In year 12, the best forms of long-term saving are getting ahead and practice exams. So I got up early to study and do practice exams every day, even if there was a sack. And you know what? Some days, maybe the best thing you can do for your ATAR is take a day off because you're exhausted. That's okay. This lets you do that without needless guilt. So how do we know what one thing to do though? Now we have some awareness of the best techniques to use and where they fit in the study process. You can use that knowledge to get bang for buck. If you're still working through content, you can target areas of weakness. An old, good, but, an old but good technique for doing this is self rating You can use a traffic light system with your syllabus like this one. If you can, try to base this off an objective measure like exams or practice questions and what you frequently get wrong. Since we know for sure that confidence and competence are two very different things. Or you could use a drawler self rating tool, which has the added bonus of being visible to your teachers. So you're giving yourself in your teacher data. Some of the best advice I got was use your teachers, sorry, utilize your teachers as your tutors. And yeah, that saves you a lot of money and means you really get the best out of your class room, out of your class teachers. You can see all your readings at a glance on your study planner. And it's good that you're prompted to check in with yourself every time you do content. One piece of the puzzle left for procrastination, motivation on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, pretty much everything I say here is better presented by the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Pink in his TED talk. Please check this out in your own time. It's amazing. Still, I'll go through some of the key parts and its relevance for you. Internal motivation is stuff like I'm studying physics because I love physics and I want to learn more. And external motivation is stuff like I'm studying to get a good ATAR and not going any further. No prizes for guessing that internal motivation trumps external motivation most of the time. 
So internal motivation breaks down into three key parts according to Pink. We have autonomy, which is the need to self-direct and not be imposed upon. Sometimes we don't like doing things we have to do. When we reframe it as a personal choice, we take back our autonomy. I have a short script here. I don't have to do this. It's my choice. Am I going to choose to do it? And just so these aren't covered up, I'm just going to drag this up here. There we go. Next is mastery. This is one of the big ones for me as a student and also explains why we tend to like things we're good at. We already feel as though we're doing well and getting better and we want to keep on getting better. So we continue to feel good about ourselves and our abilities. We may also have developed a love for what we're doing and we want to get better at it because it fascinates us. But we can still leverage mastery even if we're not good at something yet by believing that we are using effective techniques so we will get better every time we study. So I have another short script here. If I proceed with the study session, I know I'll improve. Am I willing to forego that improvement? Finally, we have purpose. And this one far outstrips the other two as being the most effective internal motivator. I've written it down as the ability to connect to a larger cause. But for me, it was about finding my deeper why and connecting everything I do to that. Maybe you can't do this yet because you're still figuring that out. In that case, you'll need to relate to the other two. But if you have that deeper why and the sense of purpose, then this is an incredible thing to leverage. I turned that into the script, I am doing this because, where you end that sentence with not because my teacher told me to. In my case, I relate it to the kind of teacher I wanna be. When you feel yourself going off task, go through these three scripts, write them down, put them on your wall if that works for you and see how appealing that YouTube video is afterwards. Come on, next slide, thank you. One last thing on procrastination. It's never just one TikTok or Instagram post or YouTube video. Here's a quick story. My family friend, Pam, quit smoking. How did she do it? She said to herself, fine, buy that cigarette. But it's not just one cigarette, it's a whole packet. And she mightn't have been able to say no before to that one cigarette. How bad could it be? But say no to a whole packet, much, much easier. Now, I am not equating TikTok and smoking, but what I am saying is that every time you go off task and open an app, you are effectively kissing the next two hours goodbye. Suddenly, it's much easier to say, I'm not willing to do that. Before I start wrapping up, I just wanna say that all this stuff is well and good and important, but ultimately, unless you're struggling, most of your time between now and the exam should be spent on exam style questions. If you're wanting a high mark, get them from a drawer, a drawer textbooks, past exams, teachers, study guides, whatever. But basically the more of these you do, the better your mark is. I can't go too much more into this though because that is next session's topic. So if you liked what I had to say today, You'll definitely like what I have to say next session. Here's some stuff to expect next time. I'll go through exam technique, how to get the most out of the practice questions you do. So you can kind of minimize the time you do that and do other fun things. And yeah, I'm going to go into detail on a technique known as post-exam autopsies. Okay, so here are some of my favorite resources and some VCAR resources listed here as a reminder. Um, this will all get sent to you. Don't worry about scribbling this down. And finally, um, here's my email. The slides will get sent to you. Don't have to write that down either. Um, if you'd like to chat with me about any of the content today or you'd like some assistance, here's my email address. I'd love to help. Okay, so... I've got enough time, yeah, all right. Let me just wrap up with this. Ultimately, what cognitive science tells us is that we have a lot more in common with each other and the smartest student in the class than we don't. We have the same cognitive architecture of working memory, long-term memory, and similar abilities to handle new pieces of information at once. We know that the difference between novices and experts is by and large their knowledge base, the number of examples or questions they see. Essentially, you are not limited by your current abilities. Your ability to learn and retain information is malleable. It's all about how you leverage your brain and how it works for you rather than your innate IQ. Similarly, if you're working part-time, something's gone wrong in your home situation like it did for me, and you're losing hours each day in public transport, you're definitely going to have less time than some other students you're competing against. But again, what do you do with the time you have left? If it's the most effective high yield study practices out there and you're using your time with your teachers wisely, in all likelihood, you can do just as well or better as someone who's basically studying full time with less effective techniques. My point is, whatever your challenge is, there's a way forward. And I think I'm out of time, aren't I?
Yeah, we're right on well, just after five. So, yeah, I think we oh. leave it there. We'll use and our I've time. And I've a lot of things. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see how I do. So Q&A function, right? Okay. Yeah, do you just want to move it off this slide? Because I think, don't think we'll use Menti right now, just yeah. looking at the yeah. time. We're not so we're not going to get out of it. Okay, I'll just put it on a, wait, I'll stop sharing. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Well, we've had a few questions come through, but first of all, big thank you, Zoe. That's been so much great information in there. I and mean, I know yeah, lots of people are going to take lots of um, tips and strategies from that. I'll just mention some of you have been asking about the next webinar uh, coming up. Um, with This is the first in a two-part series. So Zoe just ran through what the next one will be covering. And that's going to be a bit closer to your VCE exams where you'll really be focusing in on your questions. Um, so have a look in your inbox. That'll be coming around, around about the holiday time at the end of this term. I think the lights have just gone off in <laughs> Zoe's room and she's back with this wonderful. Um, so Zoe, a bunch of questions have come through and there's some more coming um, in at the moment as well. So I'll just oh. give you a second, start having to look through and yeah, I'll yeah, jump in and answer some as well um, with you. Um, but the first question here, which came early on, was a good one about is it too late to make a change in our results, which can affect our ATAR? Okay, yeah, we'll start with that one. Absolutely not. You can definitely make a change to your ATAR now. First of all, there are sacks left to go and there are, this is the exam. The exam is weighted, weighted the most heavily, so definitely worth throwing everything you can at that. Um, in terms of your SAC ranking, um, first of all, in case you're not aware, BCAR does not receive your raw, raw results. If you got 100% on your last SAC, BCAR frankly does not care. What they do care about is where they rank within your class. So essentially BCAR gets sent a number, which is your ranking within that class. The top student gets rank one, the next student gets rank two and so on. Okay, so if you've got SACs left to go, you can definitely change your ranking and that will affect your study score. So. Yeah, if your ranking is pretty low in the class right now, I would definitely recommend putting a lot of time and energy towards raising that wherever you can. Um, otherwise, you know, cut your losses, it's okay. And it's only at most like half your study score unless you're doing folio or something like that. Um, right, another advantage you have is that this is definitely something that happened to me. I experienced a little bit of burnout because I was studying throughout the year to be one of the top ranks in all of my classes. So maybe if you haven't achieved your goals yet with your subjects, maybe you haven't been exhausting yourself yet, or maybe you have and you just haven't used techniques that have been working for you. I don't know. Um, all right, what do I want to say about that? Oh yeah. So the fact that you're less burnt, you're less burnt out means that you can put in more hours now. So I hope that helps and gives you some motivation. And the short answer is. Yes, you can make a change in your results that will affect your ATAR. Go on. Okay, when did I start doing exam revision? All right, my case is a little bit unusual because um, I found myself in a situation where I was wondering if I was going to be in a good headspace when I actually did my exams and that was due to my grandmother and surrounding factors. So I was on a mission to boost my SAC ranking as much as I possibly could. This meant that, as I said, I finished all of my content for all of my subjects by end of semester one. And yeah, after that, I was basically on to practice exams. So one semester one, end of semester one is well and truly gone. So if you haven't done that already, you can't. Um, and on the other hand, I know many people who scored better than me who did not do that. So yeah, what is a common thing? is the sooner you start, probably the better off you are within reason. I mean, if you don't have capacity to do that and go through your content and keep up with classwork, then probably not a good idea. Um, so it's what I hear and you say there is, it's best not to just leave exam practice until like a week or two before the exam. Yeah, That's exactly. something, that technique, the ability to comprehend a question and write your response, and articulate it thoroughly. So that's something a skill you want to build throughout the year rather than just the week before the exam. 100%. And um, I, one thing I should add as well 
is that I was doing practice exam questions throughout. And as soon as I had my exam technique down, I was doing those timed. So I talked about the Adrolo textbooks and I, this is not just a full on Adrolo plug. You, I guess you could use other questions as well or checkpoints or something like that. But you basically want to be doing relevant questions to the topic you're studying and doing those under exam conditions if possible, because that means active recall and you're practicing those skills, even if you're not ready to commence full on exam revision. Okay, I hope that helped. Um, Feel free I... to skim through Zoe, because there's a oh. lot here. I don't think we're gonna get time to go through all of them. So have a look through, see which ones sort of stand out. Alrighty. Um, I think you answered one here about juggling exam study and upcoming SACs, sort of speaking about um, yeah, where rankings are and where you need to invest your time. We we'll probably skip that one. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with the first one I've got here. So um, just for people in case they have, can't see this, should I now get ahead with the content left from my subjects so I can get it done and get on with full exam revision? Or do I just follow the pace and revise the unit three content? Really great question. Um, I think it would also, to an extent, this depends on what kind of student you are. And I do, if you're going to make a strategic decision about this, you will need to do a realistic appraisal of your abilities and how long it's going to take you to teach yourself that content and how good you are at that subject, um, what resources you have, all of that. So I can't give you a hard and fast answer to this. Having said that, um, I think that maybe a good general strategy would be to not throw everything into unit three revision if you feel capable of teaching yourself. Keep revising that with full unit three exams and maybe do one of those a week or something like that so that that content is being revised in your mind. And again, taking advantage of space repetition and principles like that while building exam technique. So yeah, one exam per week maybe. And in the meantime, you're teaching yourself the unit four content with a drollo with whatever resources you have. Um, okay, anything to add to that, Lyndon? No, that makes sense. Having that balance makes perfect sense. Yeah, um, but, um, yeah. I don't know what's best for your individual situation. Okay, um, do you, Zoe, or uh, what would you put? Okay, I'm gonna skip some of the subject specific ones, I think. For the one about English, um, I did not do English, I did English language. So I can't, I am not in a position to answer that, I'm sorry. Um, again, English, I'm sorry. I Question here about creating a timetable for the week. You sort of mentioned that in there about how you schedule your time. Um, Maybe just a quick recap of that. Um, Okay, um, so some people do weekly study schedules. Um, I, that does work for some people, right? Um, I'm just saying what personally worked for me and it was not that. Instead, I had more daily routines. I found weekly schedules were really good in theory. I just did not stick to them. I could not stick to them for the life of me because conditions change all the time with sacks and stuff like that. Instead, I found it easier to have daily routines. For example, when I first got up every day, I would attempt a special exam without, without fail. And I would alternate each day between special exam one, special exam two. Or before I could get onto exams, I did maths revision. So that was a daily routine that was really consistent for me. Um, and then I did another subject where I did that every day. And then for my other two subjects, I alternated between the two of them. So I guess that's kind of similar to a weekly timetable, but. Um, I found that if there was just too much variation in your routine every day, it's just really hard for a habit to form. And if I wasn't in the habit of doing special exams every day, like let's say that I blocked out part of my Sunday afternoon where I was going, or Sunday where I was going to do seven practice exams back to back, please don't do that, that's a terrible idea. But let's say I was, um, I would not have done that. I would not have got it all done because I would have found something else that seemed urgent and pressing to do with my Sunday. Like, oh, I've just got this massive sack this week. So yeah, that's my take on that. But hey, do whatever works for you. Um, oh, um, I like the question. 
What type of content should we put on Anki flashcards? Great question. Stuff that you want memorized for the exam. So if you've got content that you've already sort of got in your memory um, from understanding the material, or if it's just like, oh, let me think of an example. Okay, so some people like to do, write down everything you know about natural selection and they'll do a flashcard like that. I don't, I think that's good for people like medical students who have a ton of content they need to get through and it's going to be really labor intensive to put everything on the flashcard, but I don't recommend that approach. That approach. Instead, I would say, for example, I think I had in the slide something about um, the immune system in biology. So in an exam, you would be asked to go through and put all of the steps down and write it out clearly and relate it to the context. That is something I would put in a flashcard. I guess something that an exam question could ask you to do without tailoring it too much to a problem solving context. I hope that makes some degree of sense. Um, if not, there are lots of guides to look at online, which will give you some ideas. Okay. Another question here um, around how do I, where do I find practice exam style questions specific to certain units and topics rather than full exams. Um, so you might find full exams on a VCAR, um, VCAR. website, um, but yeah, I mean, I can speak for my knowledge of Edrollo, knowing that there's progress checks, which is sort of every couple of weeks worth of work. And then you've got topic tests in there as well. Um, so you definitely can go and target particular topics, maybe that you're not confident with, rather than going, here's a whole exam I need to sit down for three hours and do. You can spend that 20, 40 minutes um, focusing on those smaller uh, areas of the course, but still getting that exam style practice. Um, Okay, yeah, definitely for sure. Um, the Adrolo platform, which probably all of you have if you're here, definitely worth doing. Um, the Adrolo textbook questions are exemplary because they are really truly modelled on past VCAR questions. So um, some resources, I can't give too much depth here because, yeah, that would be bad, but some resources ask you questions that test your understanding of the content, which is a valuable and good exercise, but not the best of use, use of your time for the most part, because you need practice with exam style questions. Um, I would recommend looking at the exam questions on the VCAR website or checkpoints or whatever you've got so that you get an idea of the style of question. So that you know what to look for when you're looking for study guides, all of that. Um, yeah, let me think. Another thing you could do is, um, this is something that I did as well. Um, I talked to my librarian and I got them to help me and help me find stuff, help me find resources and they would order it in for me and pay and company papers and all of that. So that might be something that you could try. Um, yeah, but obviously my, I'm going to recommend the Adrolo textbook and failing that other study guides. Um, there's a couple of questions here, Zoe, about, and you mentioned sort of getting that point of burnout with study. Um, so there might be some people feeling in a similar way. Were there any uh, things you found useful to help get through that phase and sort of refocus in your studies? Okay, yeah, that's a really important question. Um, take regular breaks. This is ultimately what caused my burnout as well, because I would study for hours straight and not take breaks. When I started taking breaks, things started getting better, but make sure that they are proper, proper, proper breaks. So, you know, this is not going to watch a Netflix episode because your eyes are still glued to a screen. You, I know that everybody says this, but it actually helps. Like get up and walk outside. I you can tell from how pale I am, I hate being outdoors. I would be indoors all the time if I can, but go outside. And um, I can't remember what where I got this tip, but it really works, it's from a podcast somewhere. You look outside at the horizon, like as far as you can, and then you go back. So that's all you do. And that will immediately like reset your mind and you'll be more ready to get back to revision. Um, any other tips? So make sure that you're doing a sustainable amount of study. And again, somewhere that I perhaps went a little bit wrong in year 11, actually not year 12, I was better at it in year 12. Um, 
yeah, make sure you build in some balance. Like I did, as fluffy as it is, I did deliberately put in that slide about like family, friends and like my hobby to indicate that it is important to have a life and not get obsessed or just burned out with year 12. Um, I think you mentioned in your presentation, Zoe, that was the scheduling thing again and putting those things out. What are those healthy things that you already have throughout your week? Keep them in there and then build study around that, not just go... He's yeah. study for 100% of the time and scrap everything else that, you know, keeps you sane and healthy and motivated. Yep. Yeah. Um, perhaps a couple other things on that as well. So, oh, I forgot the first one. Okay, second one then. Um, make sure that you are using effective study techniques um, and I guess try and get it down to the essence. So if you're feeling burnout, you probably will need to reduce the amount of study you do either temporarily or permanently. I don't know what your situation is. So for example, go, learning the content in layers, stuff like that. Maybe you don't go through as many layers. Maybe you don't do as many practice questions, but you make sure that whatever study practices you are doing are genuinely the best use of your time. Um, in terms of stress, ah, yes, that's right. Um, I recommend knowing and doing research. I can't explain the whole system to you now. That's just not what the purpose of the presentation was, but know how the VCE system works. So know how the SACs work, know how the exam works, know how things get moderated. And as scary as that sounds, I hope that finds puts things into perspective. Like, oh, so you're telling me that this SAC where I bombed, where, well, it hasn't actually affected my ranking that much, I guess, if I do well in the next ones. So I just need to, you know, make sure that I'm on top of the next sacks and I should be okay. So having a strategy helps with stress a lot. And that's why I often found that I wasn't stressed doing, during year 12, even if I was burned out at times. Now, I like that, having a strategy. When you've got a plan, you've got direction. That helps you yeah, know the way forward. So that's good advice. Now, Zoe, we are 17 minutes past five. There's been so many great questions coming through, but we do want to let people go and enjoy the rest yeah. of their evening. Um, so we might have to leave it there. Um, a big thank you to everyone who's come along and yeah, put in questions there. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but please do keep an eye out um, in your inbox uh, for a bit later in the term over the holidays. We'll be sending you a link for the next one, all about exam preparation and technique, um, getting ready for those final VCE exams. Um, so have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again so much to Zoe as well. Um, yeah, really value your input here this afternoon. Bye.